Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Y'all doing all right today? All right. Well, I hope you're doing better when we leave. We're beginning a brand new series today that I'm excited about. It's about uh, living in his power. Living in his power. Do you realize today that there is nothing that you and I cannot accomplish in his power? That is an amazing thing for us to realize. And, you know, the reason that I... I've got a series on this is because I don't think most of us realize it. I really don't. You know, I know that uh, we know we're going to heaven, but I don't real think that we really fully realize the power that we've got in our lives right here and right now if we know Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. It's just amazing. You know, I remember when I was a little boy growing up, my uh, dad, and I wish I had this, but I don't have it anymore, he had a uh, Bible storybook. Y'all remember those back in the day? Bible storybook. You know, we didn't have no internet, and, and, you know, we didn't have cell phones, and, you know, I was the remote control to our television. Amen. And uh, I, I tell that to some young folks, you know, the day, and they look at me like I'm, I'm ancient, you know. But how in the world did you survive, Pastor, you know? You didn't have 500 channels. No, we didn't, didn't have air conditioning. We didn't have any of that stuff. But anyway, uh, growing up, we had this Bible storybook, and it was about like this, and about like this, thick, and, and it had the neatest thing in it. It was, it was color pictures. I mean, that was just the greatest. I mean, color pictures. And my dad and my, or my mom would just, you know, when I was a little kid, they would bring that little Bible storybook into my, into my bedroom uh, every night before I went to bed, and they would read me a Bible story. Now, it could be anything from... Uh, Moses, like we talked about, splitting the wet Red Sea, you know, it could be Samson, it could be whatever, you know, uh, the boat with Peter, you know, catching the fish, and, you know, whatever it might be. But I can remember that one of my favorite stories in that whole entire book, and it still is one of my favorite stories, is the story of little David. You know, I loved little David. And I can remember, I was thinking about it, Yesterday, I was thinking about that picture in that book, and I can still vividly see that picture in the book. I can see little David, and he was dressed in like a white shirt, and I forget what he had on for his pants. I know he had pants, but I can't remember <laughs> what color his pants were, and I remember that sling that he had. And I, I can remember that the picture showed that the sling was up here, and he was twirling that sling, and I saw in the picture this big old guy in front of him, and it seemed, man, you know, when you're a little kid, and somebody is reading you this story, and they're putting a lot of emphasis in the story, you know, I don't mean they're just reading it like, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they're really putting something into it, okay? You're, you're a little kid, and so your eyes get big, you know, and you're just, you know, you're just getting into the story, and my mom and dad had such a way of bringing those stories to life to me that were just unbelievable. And I just remember the stories. And I can remember this story of David Goliath, and I thought to myself, you know, that is such a neat story. It was so neat that I remember that they, they bought me a little picture. I don't have it anymore. But they bought me a little picture. It's about like this, about like this. And I set it on my nightstand, and it was a picture similar to the one that was in the book, David and Goliath. And I was thinking yesterday, I thought, you know, that story of David and Goliath is a whole lot more than a story. It should be a way of life to you and me as a Christian. Amen? Amen. Now think about it for a second, all right? Here's David, here's Goliath. All right, pastor, yeah, we know the story. He's the one that launched that rock, killed the giant, cut off his head. We know it. Why do we even come to church this morning? I'm not going to be talking about all that the way that you think I'm going to be talking about that this morning. I want us to get this today. I, I really do. I, I feel this in my heart, feel it in my soul, that we need to understand the big principle. There's a lot of principles, but the big principle of this story is this, that we need to understand that the story of David defeating Goliath 
It is a story, it is a principle for you and I to embrace every single day that we are a Christian. It teaches us, this story teaches a lot. It teaches us how we need to have courage against the things that Satan brings our way. We need courage today. Christians need to have courage. You can have courage on Sunday mornings. It's easy. But when you and I are in the trenches Monday through Saturday, do we have courage to believe that we, through Jesus, can conquer anything that comes our way? We need to understand through this story not only courage, but the overcoming power, the overcoming power of a mighty, mighty God. It is so easy for us to look and read the Bible of old, and even with this story, or whatever other person you want to interject here, and see the victorious way that God used them back in the olden days, Old Testament, New Testament, whatever you want to say. Here's what we say. We say, okay, he did that back then, but can he do it now? Listen, the answer to that is yes. He is the same. The same. Yesterday, tomorrow, and every other day. His power is still the same. Don't look at people in the Bible like they're some kind of supernatural human beings. That's the biggest mistake we can make. Listen, the people in the Word of God were normal, everyday people just like you and me. I mean, they were ordinary people. They were people that sometimes people looked at them and they didn't even give them a second thought. If David was walking down the street today and you were walking this way, I doubt to say that you would even stop, that you would even give him this time of day because he was a scrawny kid. He wasn't anybody that you would stop and say, well, hey, he, he looks like a movie star or he looks like he could play professional baseball or basketball or football. No, he was very inconspicuous. I mean, you would, he, he wouldn't amount to anything today. But that's the kind of person that God was looking for. And it's still the same kind of person that God is looking for today. And this story, another thing it brings home to us is it brings home to us, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes, but it talks to us about the confidence. I mean confidence that you and I ought to have every day in Jesus. I mean confidence. I'm talking about a confidence that we can't lose no matter what comes our way. That's confidence. That is steadfast, concrete confidence. Not wavering. And we sit here today and we say, Pastor, I've got confidence in the Lord. Yeah, we say that. But then when things come our way, we start to waver in our minds. Can we do this? Can we do this? And then Satan even gets us to waver. Can God do this? Can God do this? And then we start to get a little bit shaky. David's going to teach us this morning that, listen, when we are so full of God, I mean when we are so full of God, I mean, when we are so full of God, we can do anything Amen. through Christ that sends us whatever. Amen. Amen. Now, following your notes, the portrayal of Goliath in 1 Samuel is probably the most detailed story of any man in Scripture. And it, oh, you've got to picture how this is working, okay? You got one hill over here, okay, two hills. You got a, a plain in the middle. On one hill is the army of Israel. On the other hill, there is the army of the Philistines, two big armies that are there. And in the middle, there was a valley. It was a plain. And Bible scholars that have tried to pinpoint where this battle took place and it doesn't really make any difference. You say, well, Pastor, I don't believe that's where the, where the battle took place. It doesn't really matter. 
But scholars have researched this, and here's what they've said. They've said this valley was probably about 100 yards wide. That means about the size of a football field. 100 yards wide. And David and Goliath, when they went together, it was a conflict not just between David and Goliath. It was a conflict that we are still fighting today. You say, wait a minute, what do you mean? I'm saying it was a conflict that represented the conflict of the ages. It is a conflict against Satan over here on one side of the mountain and God over here on the other side of the mountain. The Philistines represented Satan. The Israelites on the other side represented God. When David trotted out there, he was a representation of his God that had sent him into battle. When Goliath went out into that valley to fight David, he was a representation of Satan because he came from a very, very evil place. And it was a battle of good and bad. It was a battle of good and evil. We are still fighting that battle today. You and I can put ourselves in the place today of David. There is Goliaths out there. There are giants out there in a lot of different forms. It may be the giant of addictions in your life. It may be the giant of relationships in your life. It may be the giant of health in your life. It may be the giant of just being able to get your mind together to make wise decisions. It could be the giant of whatever you want to say, financial, whatever you want to say. You and I, we have our giants. And those giants can be interchangeable. When you get through fighting one giant and you defeat a giant, Satan is always good about sending us another giant. And let me say this. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Why in the world, if God's sovereign, if he knows everything, why in the world does God not squash the giants before they get to me? I'm glad you asked that. God doesn't want to squash your giants. He wants you and him to squash your giants. Because if he squashed every giant that would come our way, we would never ever understood, understand who we are in God. We would never understand that. We would never understand who God really is. The awesome power. If we woke up every day and we live victorious every single day, we didn't have any giants. No, our, our faith would never grow. Nothing would ever grow. We would just get up every day and everything would be hunky-dory. God says, no, I want you to grow every day in the confidence of who you are, listen to me, in me. Not the confidence of who you are in yourself. Who you are in me. That's the purpose of giants. You say, Pastor, I don't like giants. Guess what? I don't like giants either. But I tell you one thing, there is nothing better in this world to me that for me to have a giant in front of me and me to know that that giant of whatever I'm facing is insurmountable in my own self and I give that giant over to God, God gives me the power to be able to defeat that giant. There's nothing better than to walk away from that battle and say, praise God, me and Jesus, we just had a time. Amen. Amen. Some of y'all here ain't clapping. You're you're not excited yet. You know why? Because you're looking at me like deer in the headlights. You don't know what it is to win. I'm serious. Christians don't know how to win today. All they know how to do is lose. Amen. I can't get start getting some hallelujahs and amens. I'm gonna preach for three hours. This is good stuff. We have lost. We have lost. We have lost. The feeling of being a winner. 
We have. We've lost it. This world feels like they know how to win. And they act like they know how to win. They talk like a winner. They act like a winner. They do that. And Christians, we act like we're dead. We have no life. Why don't you just go ahead and die and get it over with? Amen. Seriously. I'm serious. I tell you, I have told you this for years. I am going to get a mirror up here one of these days. It's going to be as big as this screen. And I'm just going to let you see what I am looking at right now. I had three funerals yesterday, and all three of them were more lively than this group right here. They came to celebrate a life. Well, my God, we're here today to celebrate Jesus. Quit looking like you're dead. Lord Jesus, help us. Gosh. Woo! All right. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. Then Goliath, the Philistine ch uh, champion from Gath, and that's important, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of, evil, of Israel. He was over nine foot tall. Goliath was the champion of the Philistines. Gath, where he was from, that may be a little familiar to you. Do you remember when Moses sent out the spies and he sent them out into the promised land? And they came back, 10 of them came back, and they said, we cannot conquer that land. Do you know where they went? They went to Gath. And you remember what they said when they came back? They said, there is no way we can go into the promised land because we have been there. We put out our binoculars. And here's what we saw. We saw giants in the land. In fact, those people over there, they were so big, it made us look like a bunch of grasshoppers. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. You know why? Because they saw a bunch of Goliaths. People that were giants. Goliath, his family, his relatives, his cousins, his aunt was probably big. I don't know. But they were giants in the land. So much so they scared these spies. So much they came back to Moses and he see, believed them. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because nobody was able to go up and had enough courage in God to go and defeat what God had already given to them. Amen. So that's another principle at another time. But that's what they were saying. Now, Goliath was over nine foot tall. Again, Bible scholars have told us that this is probably, from what they have said, he was probably what they called in the olden times, six cubits in a span big. Now you say, what does that mean? Bible times, that meant about nine, between nine foot six and nine foot nine. Folks, that is big. Nine foot six and nine foot nine. That is a pretty big dude. He was, they say, he was probably anywhere between 400 and 500 pounds. That's a big guy. Amen? Look at, look at it. First Samuel chapter 17, verses 5 and 7. Look at what this guy is. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed over 125 pounds. You think your coat's heavy? You try wearing a coat that's 125 pounds. You've got to be a pretty big dude to wear something like that. He also wore bronze leg armor and carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam. I don't know how big that is. Tipped with, a, with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds, his armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. He even had a man to walk beside him to carry his shield. All right, and then look at his voice. 1 Samuel 17, verses 8 through 10. Goliath stood, and he was shouting at the, at the Israelites. And he shouted, a taunt, a cross to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? Why aren't you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion. I am Goliath. But you are only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. And I'll make you a deal. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy, 
as they say in the country. I double dog dare you. I double dog dare you. Armies of Israel today, send me a man that'll just have enough whatevers to stand up and fight me. Amen. Now, the way the Philistines fought was very untraditional. They didn't go army to army. They went, you give me your best dude, we'll give you our best dude. Then they fought. And they just didn't fight. They fought to the death. And then if the, uh, say the Israelites lost, they would be enslaved. They would be brutalized. Or they would be killed. And the same is the soul on the other side of the fence. But that's the way they fought. So here's the sight of this guy. Nine foot six to nine foot nine. Four to five hundred pounds. A coat that weighed 125 pounds. His voice, can you imagine the voice of a man yelling like that in a valley? It just resonated amongst the whole valley and everybody heard him and everybody was quaking in their boots. They were petrified, absolutely petrified, except for one person. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 18. David's father had his sons, sons out there in Saul's army. And he says, I need to send David out there to see how my boys are doing. So David, here's what I want you to do. And he gave, <clears throat> gave these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. All right? Hickory Farms. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. Now his daddy sent David to be the cheese person, to bring cheese and crackers and some Coca-Colas, things like that, to his brothers and to just to see how they were doing. Give him a little snack meal. He never intended to send David into battle. He was leaving that to his sons, other sons, that were seasoned. They were veterans. All he did was use David as an errand boy. Because after all, as men would look at what was going on between uh, Goliath and the, the nation of Israel, if anybody at all was going to go out there and fight Goliath, they had to be somebody that would have supernatural skills. They had to be somebody that was battle worthy, somebody that knew what it was to fight and to fight to the bitter end. I mean, they had to be the meanest among the meanest. And as Israel, the armies of Israel looked through all their ranks, they couldn't find anybody like that. But that needs to tell us something. That needs to say that man's wisdom is different from God's wisdom. Completely different. I've said this many times in ministry. God is not looking for somebody that has, if you have all the degrees on your wall, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not against that, okay? When I say that, don't think that I am because I'm not. I got six years of college too, all right? Still don't know anything. But anyway, <laughs> let's, he, he's looking for one thing. He's looking for the heart. He's not looking for you to say, well, I'm not prepared to do this. He's looking for your heart. Pastor, I've never coached a basketball before. He's not looking for that. He's looking for a heart. And as I said to somebody the other day, it's not a lot of things to basketball. You put the basketball in the hoop. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Or I've never taught that class before. I've never prayed in public before. I've never witnessed to my family members or my friends. I've never done this before. I've never done this before. God's looking for one thing. He's not looking for your experience. He's looking for your heart. God was not looking in the Israels, in their army, Israelite army, he wasn't looking for experience. He was just looking, don't miss me here, he was just looking for somebody that had enough heart Somebody that was walking close enough to him that would know in their heart and have confidence that, you know what, I don't care how big this guy is, 
when God calls me to go out there on that field, I am going to win. In fact, I've already won. Amen. Because my God is so real. My God is so real to me. I am in touch with my God, so much, in, so much in touch with my God that you know what? It is impossible for me to lose. God was looking. You give me one person like that. David was a young shepherd boy. Never been in war before. He was the youngest of eight sons. He had three brothers, and all those three brothers were in Saul's army. And David, when he showed up, he showed up to the scene. David says, what in the world is going on here? Look, if you will, at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending the defiance of Israel? David was an entrepreneur. He was a young shepherd boy. But you know what? He had heard about other people. He had heard about bounty hunters. Amen? They were bounty hunters back in the day. Pretty smart kid. He said, hey, if I'm going to go out there and beat Goliath, he hadn't told him that yet. But if I'm going to go out there and do that, by the way, what's the ransom for this dude? Show me the poster with his head on it. Show, what am I going to get? I love that. Who is this pagan Philistine anyhow that he is allowed to defy the armies of a living God? Can you imagine you as a little shepherd kid? I mean, the only thing you've done is to beat off a couple of wolves and bears that were trying to attack your sheep. This kid ain't never been in battle. And here he does. He shows up and he says, hey, what's going on here? How long has this been happening? How long has that guy out there in the field held y'all frozen? How long has this been going on? Have not any of you stepped up to the plate to take care of God's business? This is somebody that's standing out in the middle of the field. And he is cursing. He is cursing and taunting not just the armies of Israel. He is taunting our God. Isn't there anybody around here that will stand up for God that we say that we love? What is wrong with you? And by the way, what am I going to get when I take care of business? You folks, think about this for a minute. We need Christians today that will be alive and stand up for things around us that are wrong. Amen? Amen? Well, pastor, I don't want to be vocal. Open your mouth. <laughs> Amen. Amen? I am so sick and tired of people, Christian folks not opening up their mouths when something is immorally wrong. Amen. Folks, open your trap. You have as much right to yak and tell them about Jesus and what is right then they knew to tell you about what is woke. Amen. Amen. I would love to get in a debate with a bunch of woke pastors. I'd love to skin them alive. I'd love to tell them about my God. Amen. I would. They don't know what to do today. My gosh. Sissies. Listen. <laughs> you need to stand up for Jesus. Amen. And Christian folks, listen. Well, I can't do that. I'll offend my... Well, go ahead and let her fly. Amen? Amen. Amen? The word of God offends, so be it. The shoe foots, wear it. Now, I'm not trying to say go out there and not be lo loving to people. I'm not saying that. So don't run out of here. The pastor said, I could offend somebody today. I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, speak in love. Jesus always spoke in love, but here's what happened. When Jesus spoke in love, when Jesus told it like it was, if you know what, if you didn't like it, you could just, whoa, whoa, amen. That's the way it is in this church. Some folks come in here for the first time, they say, my gosh, what in the world is this place? 
and they leave. Go on down the road. Oh well. Look at look at this. David's saying, what in the world's going on? The conviction of David. Hey, why in the world is this guy staying out there? What in the world is going on? David probably thought this. Why hasn't anybody in the world, and why haven't they answered Goliath's challenge? I'm looking at all these brave men. I'm looking at some guys, probably was, looking at guys that he had looked up to all his life. His three brothers being three of them. And then who he was looking at, he was looking at the king. Who is the king? Who is the guy that's on the throne here, up on the mountain? Who is he? His name is Saul. And the Bible says that Saul was a man that stood head and shoulders above everybody else. That means he, he was also a big dude. Now, he wasn't as big as Goliath, but he stood head and shoulders. He was the king of Israel. Amen? Amen. Even Sean Connery in first night, he had a lot more courage than then in this, and Saul, y'all ever seen that movie? Pretty good movie. He was old Sean Connery. He was he was surrounded by guys, and they told that man told him, Sean Connery to bow down and, and to give up his his throne. And Sean Connery stood up and he said, "Charge!" or whatever he said, and they shot him full of arrows. He was a brave man. Amen. You know he's undoing anyway because he's Sean Connery. But anyway. Saul was in his tent, probably. He was the answer. He, he should have been the answer. Hey, if a man is a leader, he should be a leader. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. If somebody comes against this church, I don't need to be in my office right. sipping monsters. <laughs> I need to be out with you, the troops, leading the way. There's this goofy group that came here a few weeks, a few years ago. Y'all that were here, I know what I'm saying. They were out here protesting out here in our front lawn out here. I don't know. They were whacked. They were on drugs. They were out there thinking that we were for abortion. And they were some of the folks that were over here at this abortion clinic. They came over here for some reason. They started shouting out and people were coming by and there were people were rolling down their windows and they were putting their hands in people's windows and giving people brochures and people came and knocked on my door and said, Pastor, we got a problem. What's going on? They told me. I didn't say, go out there and handle it. Just leave me alone. I'm halfway through my monster. I'm not getting up. No. I took three, four more sips of my monster. I went out my door and I went out there that kook. And I said, listen. What in the world is your problem? He told me his problem, and I said, look, you get off our lawn right now. I played Clint Eastwood before Clint Eastwood. Amen. I said, get off my, get off my lawn. That man says, I'm not going anywhere. I said, oh, yeah, you are. You're going somewhere because we're calling the cops, and they're going to take your fanny and put you somewhere else. And we did. And we trotted his family, fanny down the road. But listen, getting back to where I need to be. <laughs> he and Saul was supposed to be taking care of business. And David looked up to him. He thought to myself, what in the world is going on? I have looked up to him and the rest of these guys all my life. What is their problem? I'll tell you what the problem was. The problem was with Saul, the problem with Saul was that he was not in the right relationship with his God. Listen, when Goliaths come our way, there is a prerequisite to us having victory. And that is, we just don't pop out of our house every day and say, I'm ready for battle. If we're not walking with God, we are going to stay in our tent when the giants come our way. We're going to quake in our boots. We're not going to have any confidence. We're going to be overcome by fear. David was ready to rock and roll. You know why? Because he was so full of Jesus, he couldn't think about anything else. When Jesus is on your mind, when he is all that's on your mind, when every thought comes your way and you're filtering it through Jesus, when you are filtering your lifestyle through the principles of the Word of God, when you are standing on the Word of God, no matter what comes your way, when you're eating the Word of God, 
ingesting the word of God into your life, when you are listening to the right kinds of things, hanging out with the right kind of people that are walking Jesus, folks, let me tell you something. You are full of God. And it doesn't make any difference what giant comes your way. Saul was quaking in his boots, and he had not always been that way. He was a spiritual man that used to walk with the Lord. But you know what? Have you ever tried to turn on a light at your house that wasn't plugged in? (laughs) Amen? Amen. You can sit there all day long. Go home and try it. Go home and try to do it. Plug it in. I mean, don't plug it in. I mean, it, it's unplugged, all right? Listen, you, you, you hit the light thing. You go ahead and keep doing that. You know what? That's a mark of real stupidity. But listen, that's how we do God. We get ready to fight the battle, but we ain't plugged in. Saul, he couldn't fight. He couldn't do anything. You know why? He wasn't plugged into Jesus. He was a warrior. He had, listen, Saul could have defeated Goliath in a heartbeat had he been right with Jesus. And I believe in my heart that Goliath originally was Saul's person. I believe that. I don't have a scripture to prove it, but I believe it. I think he wasn't right So God says, you know what? I'm going to find me somebody that is. And don't you think he didn't put Saul to shame? Amen? How did Saul even look at his armies? How did he do it? Every one of those guys in the army was looking to Saul. You have done it before. Why can't you do it now? Do you know that some of your unsaved friends that are watching you and watching Jesus in your life, they're watching not who you are when there's no giants. They're watching you when there are giants in your life. What are they going to do about that? And here you are. You used to talk and used to rave about how great Jesus was and how you defeated this giant and this giant. And they're looking at you and they're saying, gosh, there must be something real about this Jesus. And then they see you or myself come up against a giant and we quake in our boots. We start talking about fear. We start saying, I hope I can do this. I hope I can do this. I can't do this. I can't. Listen, when we're saying those things, we are not plugged in. We are trying to fight a battle today, my friends. You can keep on hitting the button on your light bulb, but I will tell you this, unless you are plugged into Jesus, unless you got the power of Jesus, of an almighty God coursing through your veins, those giants will defeat you every single daggum time. Amen. Amen. You show me a Christian today that's running in fear. You show me a Christian today that is laying in depression. You show me a Christian today that is just letting this world beat them up and chew them out and spit them out. You show me a Christian like that, and I will show you a Christian that is not plugged in. I Listen, God has not called us to sit there and to take it. God has not called us to be steamrolled by giants. God has called us to get plugged in to the power, and to get out there on the field and take care of business. Amen. It's been so long since some of y'all have taken care of business, you don't know what what we're talking about. So listen, hey, David couldn't do anything without God's power. He had to have a relationship, a walk with God every day. And when I say that, listen, I want us to understand this, folks. There is no way in the world that we can lose if we're full of Jesus. What was David's strategy? 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45 through 47 and verse number 49. David replied to the Philistine, to the Goliath, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. Whoa, pretty good for a teenage boy, isn't it? The armies of Israel whom you have defied, 
Today, big boy, <laughs> the Lord is going to conquer you. And I like how he does that. He didn't say today, David's going to defeat you. He said today, God is going to take care of you. I am the channel. I'm the one that's going to sling. All right, but I'll tell you this. It is not me that you're looking at, big boy. It is God in me. When you see me, you see God. I like that. Hey, why don't we say that to the giants in our life? Why don't we tell the devil that once in a while? He's throwing everything our way. Why don't we say, look at me. Look at me, devil. You want to get me down? You want to destroy my family, my marriage? You want to cause me doubt here? Have victory in my life here? Let me show you something. Hey, I don't come in my name today. I come in the name of God Almighty. Why don't you start yelling at that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on. Listen. You don't have to take it. Amen. You do not have to take it. Amen. Quit acting like a bunch of losers. Folks. <clears throat> thank you. I heard a hallelujah back there. Who was that? Somebody's. Thank you, Brian. Nobody else a hallelujah, my associate will. Amen. <laughs> oh, your lunch tomorrow. Listen. As long as it's cheap. Listen. No, no veggie pizzas, no. <laughs> Praise God, they're not of God. Listen. Verse number 46. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to cut off your head. I like that. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds, the wild birds. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Yeah. When was the last time you let the devil know there was a God in your life? Amen. When was the last time? I mean, come on. When was the last time you had a victory? You defeated a, a Goliath and you looked at the devil and you said, I told you there's a God in my life. And I'm tired of taking it. I'm tired of taking it. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. Does he not rescue you and me? Yes, he does. Mm, thank you, Dan. And not with a sword or a spear. This is the Lord's battle. The battle that you and I are facing today, it is not ours. It's his. David recognized that. Goliath was not David's problem. He gave the Goliath over to God. He made Goliath God's problem. God was just looking for somebody to fight. Somebody that was walking with him, that wanted the joy, that wanted the privilege of a victory to stand up and say, Lord, use me. That's all he was looking for. And that's all that he's looking for in your life. Give your issues over to God. Give over to him. Bring them. Put them beneath his feet. Tell Satan, tell Satan that those things are there. Walk away and know that God is going to take care of business. Amen. And listen, if he doesn't take care of business in your life, then he isn't God. Amen. Amen. It comes down to faith. It comes down to confidence. How can we sit here this morning and have the faith of a God that we've never seen? We were never there when he was crucified. We were not there on the third day when that stone rolled away. We have enough faith in a God to take us to heaven for we can spend a thousand million billion years, billion years. Uh, we have enough faith in that, but we don't have enough faith in him to take care of of the giants in our life. Folks, there's something wrong with that. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <sighs> Told a pastor not long ago, he's, I love pastors, but I'll tell you something. It's one thing I don't like about some pastors. I don't like to hear whining pastors. I don't have whining, I don't like whining pastors. And God help me, I don't have much patience for whining pastors. Sometimes I don't have a lot of 
patience with whining Christians. You know why? Because I know the awesomeness of our God. Amen? Amen. But folks, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some work. If you want to be plugged into Jesus, you're going to have to do the things that make you have power. Some of you sit here and you say, I don't have power. The reason you don't have power is because you haven't given anything to the power company. Here's a novel idea. You don't have any power in your house today when you go home. It's not an outage. It is a selected outage. They have cut you off. Why? You ain't sent them no money. You don't send them money. You don't have power. Don't blame the power company. It's your fault. Don't blame God for your outage. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? Don't blame God for your outage. Blame yourself. You're the one that hadn't plugged in. He's already there. He's got all kinds of watch for you. In the ancient days, they had three kinds of warriors. They had one that was cavalry. They had the infantry. And then they had the one we're talking about this morning. What they called the projectile warriors. You see, that's a big name. What that was, was archers. And what they called back in the day, slingers. Slingers. People that were real good with the sling. They called them slingers. And slinging, we never, I looked, delved into this a little bit this week. I always thought you just put something in there and just went. Wah, 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 wah. No, it takes a lot because you don't want to hit the person behind you. <laughs> or the person is standing over here, over here. You want to be able to shoot that thing right. It just don't, it, it takes a lot of practice. And what they did was they practiced and they practiced and they practiced. And if you read about David, you'll see that he was pretty good because he had that sling. He was a slinger. And he used that as a devastating weapon against wolves and bears and things that would come against uh, all of his sheep. He was good, man. He was really good at what he did. So when those people saw him going out there and they didn't take a spear and he didn't take this and that, he didn't take no bow and arrow, he took his sling because he knew that was his weapon of choice. You see, God had been, been preparing him with the wolves and the bears before he got to Goliath. He was pretty daggum seasoned with that sling. They might not have known it, but he was seasoned. So he went out there and he said, I'm going to sling it. Now, they say, scholars say, that you can hit with a sling if you're really, really good. You can hit something at 200 yards. That's a long ways. And they say that the velocity of a rock coming out of a sling, if it's really slung really good, is between 75 and 85 miles an hour. Now, I've seen baseball pitchers pitch 100 miles an hour and almost miss somebody's head. Folks, that would hurt. And they got a batting helmet on. Here's Goliath. David knew he had a helmet too, but he was a good slinger. So what he did was he slung it. And when he slung it, it didn't hit his helmet. It didn't hit his breastplate. It hit him right square in the noggin. Dead on center. Amen. David was good. God was the one that was aiming the rock. <laughs> who, 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 aims, who aims when we fight against our giants? God. Who takes care and knows exactly where to hit our giants? God. He knows where to hit them. He knows. I'm going to give you three things real quickly here <clears throat> to think about when you're fighting giants. Number one, get your eyes off your giants and on the giant slayer. Quit looking at your giants. Quit looking at them like they're so big and so intimidating. No, low, no, low. Look at your God. Look at the giant slayer. With God, I want you to understand this, and I want you to grasp this this morning. If you don't get nothing else I'm saying, I want you to get this one right here. With God, it is impossible, it is impossible, if you're walking with God in Bible study, standing on the principles of his word, if you're looking at your life and you know that you are right with God, there's no sin in your life, you're confessed up to date, 
If you are like that, you cannot. It is impossible. It is impossible. It is impossible for you or I to be defeated or stopped. Amen. It's impossible. Amen. If we could be, the Bible would be wrong. The Word of God says, if you and I are in our right relationship with God, we are unstoppable. We cannot be defeated. If you're being defeated today, it's because something in your life is not right with God. And if you're down and depressed, listen, it's okay to be, we all have our moments of depression. But listen, if you're down and depressed and, and the giant has got you down, okay, at least know when you're down that there's a way to victory. At least know when you're down that you don't give in to that depression. You find joy even in the bottom parts of your life to know that, hey, I'm going to give this to God and I'm getting up out of this valley. You want to stay in a valley? You're going to stay in one. You want to grab a hold of his hand? He'll pull you out. What an unbelievable life-changing thought. What a way to live. No matter what, if I'm walking with God, I win. That's an awesome statement. No matter what, no matter what comes my way today, I am walking with Jesus, I'm talking with Jesus, and you know what? No matter what comes my way today, I'm going to give it to God, and I am going to win. I am a winner. I cannot be a loser. It's impossible for me to lose. Devil, did you hear that? It's impossible for me to lose because I'm full of Jesus. I'm so full of Jesus. Bring on the giants. I'm going to give the giants over to God. I'm going to slay every last one of them you send my way because I'm so full of Jesus. And what you have to do a lot of times before you do that is you've got to get your eyes off doubters. There's always doubters. I told you about the lady that told me I'd never preach. I told you about others that have tried to be doubters in my life. And I'm not trying to stand up here and act like some kind of super spiritual hero to you today. But I've always known one thing. Me and God, when I'm right with God, are unstoppable. It's not me preaching this morning. It's God through me. He's got a vessel. He's got a channel. He's got a clean one to work through because I already cleaned myself up before I came out here. I already circled this place yesterday. I don't know how many times praying around this place because I had some time yesterday between funerals. I got myself right with God so I could be right for you. So I could be a right channel. Amen. I know what it is to walk with Jesus. I know what it is to be so full of Jesus. There's not a better time in my life than when I'm percolating for Jesus. I'll tell you right now, I smell better than fresh coffee. Amen. I'll tell you what. Hey, I, I don't have to put on a lot of cologne and stuff. I smell so good. You know why? Because when the devil smells me, the devil gets close to me, he smells the cologne of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And the same thing with you. Amen. Come up and smell you. I said, <laughs> can I give him any trouble today? No, let's keep on going. They're so full of Jesus. I can smell them a mile away. Let's keep on going. Maybe they'll be different tomorrow. Amen. It wasn't in my notes. I just said that. Listen. <laughs> Doubters. You know old Colonel Sanders. You remember him? Yeah. I love that man. Amen. He was a strong Christian. I looked up this week. Colonel Sanders. He developed that recipe, those herbs and spices. How many of them is it? Nine? How many, how many herbs and spices? Somebody tell me. Eleven? Thank you. All right. Eleven herbs and spices. He developed those. Secret. He went to restaurants to try to get them to batter their chicken in his eleven herbs and spices. Do you know? He was turned down 1,009 times by restaurants. I didn't know that. If he'd have brought it to me, <laughs> I said, you're one and done, Colonel. <laughs> I love the skin on the chicken. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. I know there's folks on TV. I'm getting off the subject. I know there's folks on TV that will say, oh, don't eat the skin. Eating skin is living, my friends. 
There ain't no better deal in the world than getting your mouth slobbered full with 11 herbs and spices. <laughs> Woo! Lord have mercy. You think, you, buy, you think your mouth's in a revival meeting. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Lord help my soul. Mmm. No, I don't want that extra crispy. I want the greasy mess. Amen. <laughs> Oh, give me another extra crispy. You know, I went to one place like that one time. I went so many times. I, thought, I remember the extra crispy came out. That guy thought in the manager. He thought he'd come on to something really good. He said, Pastor, he said, I want you to try this new chicken. We got. I said, what is it? He said, it's extra crispy. You're going to love it. I sat down and I kept on biting it. I kept on waiting for the squirts of juice. That was oil lubricating my mouth. I was raised on Greece. Listen, he said, how did you like it? I thought it was the driest mess I ever had in my life. He said, well, I guess you're going to stick with the original. I said, yep. God's always been my original. I'm going to stick with him. You know, I didn't have a thing to do with anything I'm saying. When you're going against giants, ask yourself these questions. Ask yourself these questions. Is he sovereign in my life? Does he know everything that's going on in my life? Does he know the end from the beginning? All right? Answer that's yes, in case you didn't know. Number two, does he love me with a love beyond comprehension? The answer to that is yes. Would God ever hurt me? The answer to that is no. And the last question, does he work everything for my good? And the answer to that is yes. Okay, if all that is true, what are you and I waiting for? There's a word out there called charge. You know what that means? charge. If I'm a general, I'm a general, and I say charge, and all my troops just stand there like a bunch of nuts, something's wrong. That's what God's trying to figure out. He's sitting here looking at 2024. I'm about ready to come back. There's a whole bunch of folks around here that are lost on their way to hell. There's churches out here that aren't doing a daggum thing. There's churches out here that are going woke. There's Christians out here that are letting the, the giants defeat them all the time. I'm the one that went to the cross. I'm the one that died. I'm the one that rose again to give them victory. I'm the one that's already defeating Satan. And I'm sitting here and I'm yelling in your ear as hard as I am and loud as I can. Charge, charge, charge. You're sitting there and acting like you don't know what I'm saying. Praise God, this church is charging. Amen? And people don't understand it. I got Christian friends, a Christian pastor. How's everybody going on over there? I said the same thing that's been going on for the last 2,000 years. God says charge and we're charging. <laughs> Number two, remember your past victories. First Samuel chapter 17. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Saul says, just like the world says to us when they can't understand what God's up to, they said, don't be ridiculous. And that was very encouraging, wasn't it? Yeah. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since your youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. In other words, God's been, been preparing me. When a lion or a bear comes to steal my lamb from my flock, I go after it with a club or sling and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If, a, if an animal turns to me, I catch him by his jaw and club it to death. He sounds like a pretty good guy, doesn't he? I have done this both to the lions and the bears, and I'll do this to the pagan, pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of a living God. The Lord has rescued me from the claws of a lion, from the bear, and rescued me from the Philistines. In other words, God's done everything that God's ever said he's going to do in my life. And I want to tell you something. Saul finally says, okay, yeah, I've heard enough. You're not going to shut your mouth. You're not going to be happy to your dad. So all right, go out there, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Because <laughs> obviously the Lord wasn't with him. What happened? David says, I can't lose because God's been preparing me. And God put him in remembrance of every victory he'd had. Sure, bears, lions, wolves, things like that. That wasn't a Goliath, but God had been building him up. Understand this. God had been building him up to this point. God has been building you up to whatever you're facing today too. Every single thing. Every valley has made you stronger. 
Everything that he's brought into your life that you didn't understand, that you've had faith in, that has built your faith. Built your faith. Built your faith. He has built you. He has got you right now where he wants you to face the battle of the giant that you are facing. All you've got to do is to go out there and do what you did before. The same prescription for victory has not changed. You and God, right relationship. You've got your life right with him. You ain't going to lose. And don't let anybody tell you are. And the last one is this. Run towards your problems, not away from them. Don't run from your problems. Don't be a sissy. Stand up. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord, those who give God their giants, those that give God their problems, those that wait on the Lord, who expect, who look for, Hope in him, have faith in him, will gain new strength. You're weak today? Wait on the Lord. Give God whatever it is in your life that's causing you problems. Give it over to him. You will gain new strength. You're going to regain your power. You're going to lift up your wings. You're going to rise up. You're going to be close to God like eagles. Instead of your giants beating you down, you're going to start soaring above the giant. Are y'all getting this? I mean, you're going to go flapping over your giant. Amen? They will run and not become weary. Why aren't you going to be weary? Because you're so full of go-go juice from Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. You're full of Jesus. I don't mean monster drinks. I mean you are full of the power of the blood of Jesus. Man, it's coursing through my veins, Pastor. I can't hardly stand it. Well, get out there and do something. Amen. God gave me a blood transfusion when I was eight years old. You say, well, what hospital did you go to? I went to the hospital of sinners. <laughs> Said right on hospital sinners. I asked Jesus to save my soul. I asked Jesus to forgive me my sins. He took my whole life away. And he applied the blood of Jesus to my life. Amen. And as long as I let the blood of Jesus take care of everything that comes my way in life, I ain't got no problem. Amen. How can I lose when I'm full of the blood of Jesus? <laughs> they will walk and they won't grow tired. Man. Well, you know, I'll say this to you. You can't be encouraged by what you heard this morning, something wrong with you. Yeah. Amen. I got encouraged when I, was, when I was putting it together this week. I thought to myself, you know, if they don't light your wood, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You're waterlogged if they didn't light your wood this morning. There's always somebody in the church. I remember what this, old, this woman told me. I call her an old woman. She was probably, I don't know, maybe four years old. I call her an old woman. She's really an old witch. But listen, <laughs> she, she came to one of our services. She was from the north, that tells you. But she was from Canada. Uh, I said Canada. But uh, she came here to one of our services and she wrote me a letter <laughs> once she got home and she told me that she didn't like our service. She really did. I'm serious. I think you read the letter. She said, you yell too much. You scream too much. You should be more dignified. You should be, you know, even your appearance is not what a pastor ought to have. Listen, I'd brush my teeth. I don't know what was wrong with her. You know what I said to that letter? <laughs> because she's probably one of those people that come to church, crosses her little old hands, Waits to the music to get so loud to go. Pssst. Here's Tim playing the drums. Oh. 
hear Rick holding out one of them Eric Clapton's things. Ah! <laughs> hear one of the singers singing real loud like Sion Dion or whoever her name is. Ah! Looks at the big screen. Ah! <laughs> Sees we don't have any hymnals. Ah! What is the world coming to? And then sees a pastor come out with Jane and said, Oh my gosh, I knew, honey, we'd see the day. Oh my Lord. Listen, I can't help it. When I get full of Jesus, I got to let it out. Listen, if you got to burp, sometimes you got to burp. You ever watch folks try to hold a burp? You go around like this. It'll hurt until you let it out. So when you get full, full, so full of Jesus, don't go around this way like this. Open your mouth and let it fly. We better stand up. I'm...